Good morning and welcome to the FSR webinar entitled A Presentation of ACER, the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators that will be presented by Professor P. Poranci, the Chairman of the Board of Appeal of ACER, Principal Advisor of Florence Corp Regulation and a Professor of Universita Cattolica in Milan. My name is Magdalena Mosch and I am a coordinator of, uh, training coordinator of uh, Florence Corp Regulation. And I will just briefly explain the webinar agenda before we will connect to Professor Ranchi. The first point is the introduction. So this is, this is exactly what I'm doing right now. Uh, it means that in this part I will also explain briefly the control panel of the webinar software that you can see right now on your upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we'll connect to, to Professor Ranchi to proceed with his presentation. Then we will start the Q&A section and in this section Professor Anchi will answer for the question submitted by the audience. I will briefly explain how to submit your question in just a couple of seconds. And then I will conclude this webinar with just final announcements. So this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. So let's just um, focus uh, right now on some of the features that you have in your control panel. So the first one is this uh, orange arrow. The orange arrow is um, to minimize or to, to open or to close the control panel. So if during the presentation of Professor Ranchi you would like to have the presentation on your full computer screen, just please click on that arrow and this will allow you to see the presentation on your full screen and the control panel will be minimalized. However, if you would like to, for instance, submit a question to Professor Anchi, just please click on this arrow and the control panel will appear again on your computer screen. However, if you would like to minimize the whole webinar and you would like to check your email or check something on the internet, please just click on the bottom just below. Uh, this is to min minimize the window. It means that you will be still connected to the webinar, but um, you will be able to see also something else on your computer. However, I encourage you to close uh, your email and to close all programs like Skype or Facebook because this can interfere with the internet connection and uh, this can um, cause some problems um, to connecting to our webinar and to hear and to see everything on the computer screen properly. The hand raised tool that you can see right now just uh, just below, uh, this is the button that I would like you to use right now if, so if you can see my presentation right now on your computer screen or if you can hear me uh, and everything is okay, just please click on this button and I will know that everything is okay and from technical point of view. Okay, I can see right now that uh, you are clicking. Okay. Okay, I see that there was some problems, a couple of attendees had problems with the presentation. I think that right now you can see that. You can see the presentation. Okay. Okay, I have confirmation from you. Thank you very much. Uh, just below you have the question box. The question box is the place where you can submit the questions to Professor Ranchi. So uh, if you would like to ask some questions also during the webinar, please type it in the question box and your question will be submitted. Uh, in this way, I will be able to, to ask this question to Professor Ranchi uh, in the Q&A section and he will answer for your questions uh, in the Q&A section. Okay, so right now we can proceed to the presentation and uh, I will connect to, to Professor Ranchi. Uh, I hope that he can, he can hear me. Let's just connect. Good morning, people. Can you hear me? Good morning, Elena. Yes, I hear you very well. I hope everybody hears us. <laughs> I hope that they can hear uh, us so good too. Good morning to everybody. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I, I hope that they can hear us and if there are any problems just please uh, type it in the question box and I will understand that there is something wrong and we will, ha we will try to resolve it at once. Right now uh, people I will connect to your computer screen that we can see your presentation. Uh, okay, show my screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I can see your presentation. I hope that also our audience can see the presentation. So uh, right now I will mute myself and uh, people I will connect to you again in around 40 minutes. Uh, so please, good luck. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm sorry, people, do you have any problem with the, with the presentation? Uh, you, you told me that you were going to connect me, so I was... Yeah, 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 you are connected. Okay, you are connected. Can I start? Yes, please proceed. Very well, thank you. Thank you. I can. Oh, I'm good. I, I can put it full screen, can I, so that everybody sees it? It's full screen, we can see okay. that. Thank you. Good. So, uh, uh, I am going to present you the newly established Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators, ACER for friends. And um, well, should we should start asking ourselves uh, which are the reasons for it to exist? And uh, why does Europe need an energy regulator? Well, I should like to first have your, your opinion on this. And uh, so I ask you this basic question. Would an energy system work better without a regulator? And uh, uh, you have the answers, and so uh, you should uh, provide, uh, picking your, your own answer. I see that you are voting. And I wait for all of you, or almost all of you, to have expressed their own preference. Yes, go on. We are getting to 90% of the votes expressed. And, uh, well, that's probably enough uh, for us to go on. Our time is very precious this morning. So I close the polls, and uh, these are the results. You can see them. And you see that there is a large support for having uh, a regulator, but not universal. And we have... Uh, well, a conditioned support, about uh, uh, a quarter of you says yes, but under the condition that the regulator is good. And I think this is very sound. Um, and then there is another opinion uh, expressing uh, a, a possibility that has been long discussed among the experts that is, we could do without a regulator and let the competition authority do uh, the job. As we shall see, uh, um, it is not so easy. It would not be so easy. Let me go on a while, and thank you for answering. Uh, just a, a, a few minutes of uh, economics. Uh, economists uh, have this basic idea that wherever you have a network or any other type of uh, essential facility, something that has to be used by all, but cannot be duplicated economically, then you have to have someone regulating access and uh, tariffs. Uh, this is the base. And this is largely accepted. Uh, what is less largely accepted is, do we need a regulator in liberalized markets? where we have many, uh, many subjects uh, competing. Uh, well, what, what is the use of a regulator in that case? And to give an answer, I invite you to have a look at other liberalized markets. Uh, look at, for instance, look at the financial markets. Uh, there is no network there, no essential facility, yet a uh, few people would support the idea of having financial markets fully unregulated. Uh, a regulator is, of course, it should be a good regulator, 
but uh, but but it has a function. Uh, uh, it, it has a function because uh, it, there is no one monitoring markets, imposing transparency. Uh, then the market doesn't work well. And then if there are abuses, and here comes the difference between a regulator and the, and, and the competition authority, uh, a competition authority can spot and punish abuses of market power, but only after the abuse has been performed. And that may be too late for markets with transactions happening very quickly and with the huge investments at risk, uh, it is better to establish norms and rules of behavior so that you can prevent abuses and reduce the number of cases in which you have to punish them afterwards. And then the last task is to protect the small consumers. So these are the basic reasons why most uh, uh, observers, experts, believe that a regulator in an energy market uh, uh, has a function and, and is a very essential and crucial function, so in short, is necessary. And this is why when we had a worldwide wave of liberalizations starting in the 1980s, and affecting the energy markets and also other se sectors like uh, transport and telecommunications. In all these cases, regulators were set up. Uh, so uh, it is not that when you liberalize, there is no longer a justification. Quite the contrary. Uh, you need the regulator to accompany uh, liberalization and prevent it from derailing, uh, let us say. So this happened and, uh, well, different countries around the world set up uh, bodies called in different ways, agencies, offices, authorities, commissions, uh, but all of them had one basic function of regulating the market. Uh, there was a model uh, existing, uh, the model of the Public Utilities Commissions, uh, which had been uh, existing and operating in uh, most, most or almost all uh, the states of the US. Since uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, they had, uh, and they still exist and they still operate, uh, but of course they were born and they long operated in a context of local monopolies. So that, uh, that was a model, but it was an old model. It had to be adapted to the con new context uh, uh, of liberalized markets. And this is what uh, mostly Europe did, based on early experiences of some European countries, uh, basically the UK and uh, the Nordic countries, and taking up the issue at the level of the European community at the time, and, and then Union. Uh, the thing started uh, with the issuing of an early couple of directives, one for electricity and one for gas, in 1990-91, establishing the obligation for a member state to let energy go through in presence of a contract between two bordering uh, states. Uh, that was the beginning of the idea of an energy market. Uh, con contracting parties had a right to have their contract uh, uh, executed even if that implied crossing two or even six borders. That was the beginning, but then the debate on the European energy, internal energy market went on and the basic directives were issued in 1996 for electricity and in 1998 
for gas. Directives accompanied by regulations. Directives to be transposed into the uh, member state uh, legal systems. Regulations immediately and directly effective uh, focused on specific limited technical issues. Uh, well, that was the beginning of it. It took a couple of years to have these um, uh, norms uh, transposed and, uh, and then another couple of years to see that they worked, but not perfectly. So that, in fact, a second wave of directives and regulations was prepared and issued in 2003 with uh, introducing a stronger unbundling of the networks, separation of the networks from the energy operators, and establishing one regulator in each member state, not as an option as it was before, but as a, an obligatory um, decision that member states should take. So that the panorama of the regulators at that point had to be completed. Yet the new uh, setting was seen as imperfect. Uh, it uh, did not uh, allow the internal market to function well. And so discussion started again to see what was required. And new decisions were put into what was called the third package presented by the Commission in 2007 and finally adopted after long debates in 2009. And it included a stronger unbundling, a stronger independence of the member state regulators with respect of their own government, and the setting up uh, of the Agency for Cooperation of Energy Regulators, the, the, the object of our, of our conversation this morning. Uh, before we go on, remember that in the same year, the Green Package was approved, uh, regulating climate policies and the, the interference reciprocal between energy policy and climate policy. So that 2009 was a really important year and these decisions uh, were taken and ACER was set up and in a couple of years uh, it was brought into action. Uh, let me ask now a question uh, to you. Uh, uh, what, it, took, it took 20 years uh, to do all this job that I have been describing. Uh, too long? Too much? I see that you are voting. And I watch you. And I wait until uh, a very high percentage of you, if not 100, has voted. We are approaching the critical level of 90%. Not yet. Please go on. Someone is still in doubt. Uh, here we are. And uh, well, we have uh, a large majority, something uh, uh, approaching two thirds, saying uh, no, uh, it wasn't too slow. But one third, this is something more than one third, says uh, yes. It is. Uh, it, it has been too slow, and it has been slowing down the growth of the economy. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's difficult to say uh, because uh, one should appreciate the obstacles. Looking at the long run, uh, the history, it, it has not been a long period. But looking at the challenges 
that Europe faces, uh, well, uh, time is very is very short. Time is very short, and uh, and, and the, the internal market is not yet complete. But let's go back to the regulators. Uh, you see that they were set up in all member states. Uh, they uh, immediately understood that they had uh, to work in common, so they established a council to exchange experiences, to establish good, crisis, good practices that could be imitated and spread, to coordinate their initiatives, because they saw that the markets were larger than the territories that each of them could regulate. And, uh, and stakeholders were big, sometimes much bigger than the smaller uh, states. Uh, the, the European Commission saw that this cooperation was good and uh, jumped into the process by establishing opportunities to meet for the regulators to meet and for the Commission itself to meet them and to meet the stakeholders, uh, uh, cutting across the complex bureaucracy of member state meetings in Brussels, establishing the habit of a periodic meeting in Florence for electricity and in Madrid uh, for gas. This was uh, useful so that the Commission uh, transformed uh, this uh, group of regulators into an official body, an official body giving advice to the Commission itself. And that was the base on which ACER has been built. Uh, ACER is based on one of the regulations uh, which are part of the third packet, regulation number 713. And let us have a look at its basic functions. But again, let me ask you a question first. Uh, And uh, have a look at this, quest this question and uh, make your choice. Uh, you are voting fast. Not fast enough. So quick. <laughs> Go on. Uh, here we are. Almost all doubts has been overcome. Someone is still in doubt. Uh, okay. Okay. Here we are. Well, you had it wrong. Uh, it uh, the, the 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 least uh, appreciated. Uh, option is the right one. So Acer is growing fast. But let's go. Which are the tasks? The basic tasks are first to improve the regulatory framework of the union. Uh, this is a key measure to complete the internal market. Uh, it is also a matter of cost. Uh, large companies operating in the area uh, have to deal with the different rules in different parts of the same market. And this is no good. This is a burden. And this slows down development. Uh, then uh, ba one basic task is to help member state to eliminate cross-border uh, barriers, regulatory barriers, and also, well, there is the big uh, issue of the infrastructure barriers. 
uh, help member states face this issue, cooperate better. Uh, you see, uh, one issue that has long been discussed is that when uh, large markets emerge and regulation is still limited to a smaller portion of this large market, there is a gap, a regulatory gap, which is an obstacle to development. The regulatory gap in the European Union is present. In many fields, energy is just one of them, and the regulatory gap should be filled and overcome. Why? Well, this, the simple solution uh, is the one that has been uh, chosen. Set up an independent central entity. Uh, there were other options, but these are in the wording of the regulation, in the official wording of the legal document, an independent central entity offered a number of long-term advantages over other options, uh, which is sort of straightforward if you look at the issue from outside. But of course, uh, that implies dealing with an existing situation of uh, local member state level regulation, how to overcome this. First, by coordination, which is in the same, in, in the name of ASA itself. Uh, coordination among regulators in the first place, of course. But look, this, again, these are official words. Uh, coordination and uh, completion. Where norms are insufficient, they should be completed not just coordinated. Then the coordination among the transmission system operators, the, the, who are already associated, but they should cooperate very smoothly to ensure that the day-to-day -day working of the system is smooth. And there is one specific issue here, which has to be considered. Uh, when uh, energy crosses, uh, uh, there, there are, there are um, issues uh, when uh, new lines of electricity or new pipelines for gas are built. The general rule is that the new lines should provide the same third party access as the existing network. Uh, those who build these lines usually ask for an exemption, at least a temporary exemption, but rather long, from third party access obligation to make sure that they will cover their costs. And this exception has been in principle accepted by the Commission and by the, by the member states, but it should be limited. And not, it is not automatic, so there has to be a request. But that is typically an issue that implies, involves more than one member state, more than one national regulatory uh, agency or authority. In this case, ACER jumps in, either upon a request from the local regulators involved or in case that they are not able to agree. So there is substantial power in the hands of ASA to solve problems of insufficient or, or uh, in contradictory regulation at the member state level. Uh, so far with coordination then we, we have to look at the rules for the use of the networks. Uh, the, the rules are set by the member state regulators in network codes and these network codes should respect a common framework guideline. And ACER has to take care of developing framework guidelines. 
they are not specifically binding directly that would conflict with the network codes, but the network codes have to comply to the guidelines. Uh, and so this is, there is a power of ASA that is more indirect than direct, but it is very substantial. And it comes out that every time network codes have to be reviewed, which happens particularly in presence of technical innovation. Think at, just think at the, all the large issue of uh, smart grids. Uh, technical innovation implies reviewing network codes and ESA imposes uh, common, a common framework to these revisions. So that even when the Commission has to adopt uh, decisions in this field, the Commission should listen to ESA. Uh, then there is a specific issue which is uh, the fact that when energy goes through different borders, uh, there are TSOs, transmission system operators, uh, who are not in the place where energy originates, not in the place where energy is uh, consumed, so are not in the position to uh, receive a tariff unless they add up another tariff which, will, uh, which would make it very burdensome, what, what is called uh, uh, tariff uh, sa sandwiches. Um, so the, the common solution uh, has been to reward this intermediate TSO uh, for the costs incurred in the transits of energy. Uh, let me ask you, uh, do you agree with this practice that has been introduced year, years ago? Uh, you see, this uh, compensation in favor of the TSO that stays in between flows, long distance flows of energy. And I see that you are voting. Yes, it, you, you, you are taking some time because you have to think a, a minute about this. This is not so obvious. So I see that a large majority of you has reached a conclusion, taken a decision, and uh, uh, the uncertain one uh, uh, remain uncertain, so I close now. And uh, look, there is a large majority, uh, large majority in, in favor of compensation. Uh, the opposition, the reasons for opposing it are, are, are interesting. Uh, the first reason, each network should charge uh, is the old uh, system that was, uh, that was uh, present before the beginning of the effort to unify the European market and uh, it would introduce a barrier and a burden, which is the reason why uh, it has been let aside, abandoned. Uh, the other reason is a bit more tricky the marginal cost is zero for each new flow, but that could apply to internal flows as well. So who, who's going to pay for the fixed costs? Uh, 
Um, so in general, uh, the solution that you prefer is the solution that has been adopted. And, uh, and it is not so straightforward. The, the setting of this uh, mm, compensation has been very controversial. And now Acer will have a responsibility for monitoring it and of course also for monitoring any change of it should uh, there be some reason uh, for changing it. So uh, let's go on and uh, uh, we have to look at the further task uh, that his uh, Acer uh, was not foreseen to have uh, in the basic document setting it up. Monitoring of markets has been introduced through a later document, regula a regulation issued in year 2011 when ESA was already operating. This is an interesting principle. Once you have a European body in charge of regulation and you still have regulation in the hands of all all the regulators but new tasks are naturally entrusted to the European regulator and this is a very tricky task uh, monitor markets uh, assure, to assure the integrity and transparency means a lot of work it means uh, meeting the request of confidence by the operators, ensure that competition is fair, and the ways to uh, reach uh, equilibrium between supply and demand are performed in a fair way, and that there is no market abuse or no profits drawn from market abuse. This implies a number of uh, instruments for monitoring, that is a number of indicators in the retail market, in the wholesale markets and on network access. And this also implies uh, defining the indicators, spotting the body who is in charge of uh, measuring what happens in the market and uh, uh, put the indicators together to have an idea of how things are going and have a look at the indicators, the rates of switching, prices, concentration rates and market shares of operators, norms and uh, practices to ensure consumer protection, and then uh, on the wholesale market, we have uh, the degree of utilization of uh, the existing networks. NTC is the net transport capacity, which uh, should be proportioned to the amount of energy that has to go through. And uh, not only in the normal day ahead uh, uh, contracts, uh, but also in the short time, intraday. And if the market works, we should see price com prices converge. And uh, we cannot do uh, completely without congestion, but we know that congestion creates rents, and all this has to be uh, watched very closely. Also, the delays in connecting new operators and uh, the huge problem created by generation from renewable sources, intermittent, uh, which creates the need, uh, sometimes often the need, to curtail service. So this is a huge task and it could be the end of it, of our discussion, except that new tasks are coming up at the horizon and uh, a new guideline for the building of new infrastructures is presently under examination of the Commission 
and uh, ACER has a say in this proposed regulation on guidelines for the new infrastructures. So you see, this is a very challenging task and, uh, and this is the way Europe is doing what it has been doing in the last uh, 25 years. That is gradually, step after step, build up uh, common institutions and common rules, which is a historic task. Now I should like to have your questions and I'll try to <laughs> provide answers as appropriate as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, people. And right now we can proceed with the Q&A section. There are some questions submitted by our participants. And right now I will just read some of those questions to you. Uh, the first question will be, uh, by 2014, the internal electricity market should be established. What will be the task of ACER and the national regulator authorities after 2014? How will they share their responsibilities? Uh, once uh, the European market is uh, hopefully uh, completed, uh, well, paradoxically, we are not going to have one market. Uh, we, we can look forward towards having common rules everywhere, but separation of uh, islands and of some large regions uh, uh, due to geographical causes uh, will not be overcome uh, in a few years. Uh, the the I Iberian Peninsula, Italy, uh, uh, the, the, the Balkan area, particularly the southern Balkan area, um, uh, we, we cannot realistically imagine that they, they are fully integrated uh, day to day, minute by minute, uh, without any obstacle uh, to the large uh, you know, central European area. So common rules, but not fully uh, common market. We, we, we hope that the interchange, even with the remote areas, will increase, uh, but uh, some differences will remain and some congestions to be monitored will remain. Also in the working market, there will be monitoring tasks and the rules for accessing the networks will have to be kept uh, in line with the technical change. So there will be a task. Consumers will be there and small consumers will have to be protected. So there is one risk that will have to be avoided, that the regulators, uh, whether member state of ACER, stick to their powers without uh, uh, continuously re-examining whether their task uh, is still necessary. This is one point. Those who deny the usefulness of regulation um, should stimulate regulators to be critical, uh, even self-critical on that. Okay, thank you. And now we can uh, ask the next question. The next question will be, did Acer already decide about the cross-border issue? Uh, Acer does not have to decide about the issue of uh, compensation uh, for cross-border trade, if that is what uh, is meant uh, in the question, uh, because uh, that basic decision has been taken before and ESA has the task to monitor, uh, not to reverse that decision, to monitor the implementation of the system for uh, inter-TSO compensation. Uh, I remind you that this is uh, uh, this is applies to electricity, not to gas. Uh, but the unification of the gas market will raise analogous questions, and that is a matter where ASA will 
sure, have a say. In electricity, the system is there, uh, but probably it will have to be periodically adapted, improved, and again, ESA will have a role in this. Thank you. That's all. This the third question will be, uh, if ACER's framework guidelines aren't binding, how can it be enforced that network codes are in line with them? Uh, ACER can act uh, on uh, uh, requests from operators or regulators who uh, resent uh, this lack of coordination. Uh, it can also act unilaterally if they see that uh, there is something to be to be changed. Uh, I, I, I think that both in the norms and in the practical approach, ASA will not uh, try to overrule Rather, it will try to coordinate and uh, induce changes uh, uh, based uh, on the common belief that it is in the common interest to have a system that works, uh, that does not create uh, discrimination or adverse incentives in terms of uh, efficiency and uh, growth uh, of the market and uh, growth of the companies as well. So I, I believe that the, the real question when you have uh, inconsistencies or, or, or lack of coordination is uh, to ask why. Why do we have them? Where, where are the different interests behind? I'm very, I'm strongly convinced that the real power of ACER is relying on a common preference for reasonable solution with respect to non-reasonable solution. That will, that is the way in which the coordination uh, the self-coordination of regulators uh, without having is, uh, has worked so far and it can work much better by having it. Uh, technical inquiries many times help in clarifying one issue and inducing decision makers to change uh, their mind and their regulation. But of course, if conflicts uh, emerge, then ESA has the power to, to impose a solution. That's, that's my, my answer. The next question will be, what is the relationship you expect ACER and CER to develop? Uh, the question uh, was already raised when uh, that uh, official consultative body, ERGEG, was created, uh, set up by the Commission in 2003. Uh, ERGEG uh, uh, was a, a group of people uh, physically coinciding, almost completely coinciding with CER. <laughs> in fact, the board of CER used to meet in the morning and the board of ACER in the, uh, or, or, or Vergag in the afternoon or, or in the morning of the following day. Uh, uh, so the, the distinction uh, was set uh, by the fact that uh, ERGEG was a consultative body and so it had to answer the requests uh, of opinions advanced by the Commission. CR was an association, remained an association, taking care of elaborating common idea, elaborating common initiatives, and also dealing with practical problems uh, such as, uh, uh, let us say, across the stages of uh, employees, uh, the training of employees. Uh, it had the same setting up the foreign school. 
as a, as a basic instrument for research, training, updating, and, and uh, circulation of uh, information and knowledge. Uh, that had nothing to do with ERGEG. Um, uh, now, ERGEG has been replaced by ACER. ERGEG does not exist any longer. ACER is there, has precise tasks and precise uh, powers, and uh, uh, that is what it will do. But then, of course, the regulators still have uh, their own uh, needs to elaborate proposals, ideas, practices, to exchange uh, experiences, uh, to organize common training or common uh, study groups uh, to clarify issues. They are free to do it, and it is very positive that they do it. In fact, uh, ASA has in its institutional structure um, a, a, a board of regulators having uh, competence on the contents of, of the of ASA's decisions before they are taken. Uh, well, this board of regulators largely coincides with the board of the CDR. So you see, the, the, uh, I see this evolution as uh, very positive and promising. And that's my answer. Thank you very much. We have time for one last question. And the question will be, do you expect a fourth package? And if so, then when? Uh, if you ask this question to any uh, official in the Commission, the answer would be immediate and sharp. There is no need for any fourth package. Uh, well, I don't see uh, the, the need for a fourth package now, uh, but I'm not so sharp in my answer. Uh, it very much depends on the way the present uh, norms rules are implemented. And I cannot fully exclude that if new obstacles uh, come up to surface because of uh, non-fully -co non cooperative behavior of some member states, some new legislation might be needed. Uh, the present situation is not a fully functioning internal market. We still have uh, problems in the wholesale market, in the interconnections, in the access to networks, and very much in the retail markets. Uh, so the priority is solve the issues by implementing the existing uh, body of rules. And there is a lot that can be done here, but I cannot exclude that uh, if this does not work, some further decision will have to be taken. Uh, that's my opinion, of course. And Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for answering this question. Thank you very much for the whole Q&A section. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we won't be able to answer for any other questions. But you will be able to contact Professor Ranchi uh, through email and to ask your question again to him directly. I will give you the contact details in just a couple of uh, minutes in the conclusion part. And right now, unfortunately, I have to say goodbye to our today's speaker. So people, thank you very very much for, for today's webinar. It was a pleasure to host you. It has been a pleasure for me. Thank you very much for your participation. I, I've seen it in the polls, uh, at least, and I, I, I'm sure that you have been uh, active. <laughs> I have been active, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, th thank you very much, and uh, I will talk to you very soon uh, to, to talk about the whole experience, and I hope that those our participants enjoyed it. And right now, I will connect back to my computer screen, so people, I have to mute you, unfortunately, right now. And uh, so thank you very much, and goodbye to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. 
And right now I will connect once again to my computer screen that we can proceed with just some uh, final slides of my presentation right now. And uh, just to conclude very briefly uh, this webinar. So the conclusions. In this section, I will just basically sum up everything that we said until now, and, and I will also uh, briefly explain you the survey that will appear automatically on your computer screen in the moment when I will close today's webinar. This survey is consisted of eight questions, and if you answer for this question, it will help us to evaluate today's session and also make some improvements in the future webinars. And the announcement, the next webinar will take place on 22nd of May at 11 a.m. Central European Time. And it will be entitled Capacity Markets. And the presenter of this webinar will be Carlos Battle, the Associate Researcher, Research Professor in the Institute of Technology Research in Comillas University in Madrid. So you will be able to, to register for this webinar all through our website. Yes, if you go to uh, the Florence School of Regulation website and if you go to the training section, uh, you will find the webinar section there and there will be a link to register for the, for the webinar. And also tomorrow you will receive a follow-up email from me where I will thank you for participating today in, uh, in this webinar. And also you will find a registration link to register for the next webinar. So please don't miss your chance to register for the next event. And here are the contact details. So if you would like to contact me, if you have any questions regarding the webinars and uh, the future webinars maybe, or uh, any other technical uh, issues connected to the webinars, please contact me and use the emails that you can see right now on your computer screen. And if you would like to contact Professor Ranchi, uh, you can use the email that you can see right now below. Uh, he will answer for all the questions that you have regarding today's webinar. Okay, so this is the moment when I have to say goodbye. I would like to thank you very much for participating today, and I hope that you will join us in our future webinars in May or maybe in June. So thank you very much, and you will find also other information on the webinar on our website. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Goodbye.